Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, that was pretty good, even with the masks. Um, good morning, everyone uh, watching online. Uh, great to have you with us this morning as well. Uh, appreciate that it's all been quite sudden and uh, we've had to adjust both here with the masks as well as uh, for those of you who have had to stay home and, and join us online. So welcome everyone. My name is Rob Sharp and I'm the Senior Minister here at MAC and it's, it is good to be together whether that's be in person or online. Um, welcome if you're visiting with us today uh, and if you're a regular member of our church family. It is good to be together. Uh, today we've come to praise our God and to pray to him as we listen to him speak to us. We come together each week to know Christ uh, and that's what we're going to be doing together today. We're going to hear God speak to us from his word as we come into the book of Luke. We're going to be picking that up for a couple of weeks, uh, asking questions really as we with Luke investigate the man who is the son of God Today's question is, who will heal you? Uh, I think that's both a, a question of our times, but actually the answer is the, the greatest and most important thing because it's for all people for all time. Uh, so it's going to be great to be hearing from God's word about that. But let's hear about uh, the God that we've come to meet with and praise this morning. From 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. That's our God that we meet with this morning. Uh, so let me begin our time with prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we do praise you uh, because in your great mercy, you have given us a new birth into this living hope You've made us alive through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we've come, can come into an inheritance that unlike anything in this earth, it will never perish, spoil or fade. And so we thank you that we can come together and we can meet you in your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought it'd be great for us to pray together. We've got a prayer of thanksgiving uh, times like these, it's easy to get caught up on what's lost and what's missed, uh, but also I think it's good for us to, to thank God. And so we've got this prayer of thanksgiving that should come up on our screen. Uh, let's join in saying this out loud together. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to have... Uh, a song now it's going to be a youtube song it's going to come up on the screen and unfortunately we can't sing out loud but we can sing in our souls uh and so it's a great time just to reflect on these words and it will also be our offertory song uh and so whoever was on welcome hey good on you Alan. fantastic um this will be the moment and so i'm going to give thanks to god for our offertory now let's pray Heavenly Father, thank you for that we have these gifts to share. Help us to be generous in supporting the work of the gospel here at Mac, into the highlands and to the nations. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's reflect on this first song. <clears throat> Well, we've got uh, time for some church news now. And so first up is to do with our vision and mission meetings that we were having last week. Uh, it was really great to come together. We had 109 people attend uh, our different meetings, the seven meetings over the week, which was really fantastic. I was really encouraged to just see how open uh, people were to considering it. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll join with me in praying that we continue to be reflecting on it and praying about it ourselves as we move forward as a church. But part of the meetings were that we had a vote 
uh, for those of you attended, you know we voted on three or yeah, got to vote on one of the three different logos. And so uh, if we want to do a bit of a drum roll, come on, everybody. This is our moment. Are you ready, Chris? Uh, this is the one that got voted in. Uh, this is our new logo. Well done, everyone. Oh, uh, Alan's very excited. Uh, clearly, that was what you voted for, mate. Um, and so you'll start to see that uh, getting around more and more on various different things. Uh, so that's really exciting. That's just a key step for us moving forward. Um, okay. Now, sadly, Margaret, uh, who is a cross-cultural worker that we partner with, was due to come and share with us today. Uh, unfortunately, she can't because of the travel restrictions. So Margaret's gonna be visiting with us in person at a later time, and that'll be really great. We thought it was still really valuable to have her come in person, but she's uh, sent us a little message. Uh, so let's check this out now. Hello, my brothers and sisters in Metagong. I am so disappointed I can't be with you to today. Look, I even bought you some delicious baklava. Uh, maybe I'll buy you some fresh stuff when I come down in hopefully over the next few months. Um, over this lockdown period, um, I won't be able to visit the ladies I plan to visit and do some of the things I plan to do. And so I'm gonna be spending that time ringing them. Please pray they um, are comfortable talking on the phone. Um, I'm gonna be reading, um, hopefully improving my Arabic as well. Please pray that it all goes in my head and stays there. Um, please pray that I can use this lockdown period uh, fruitfully and that our Zoom calls and uh, phone calls with the ladies with different groups will be effective. Um, we're not sure if our pantry can go ahead next week. I think it can, um, but we'll see. Please pray that um, we will be able to use this very different time still for the glory of God. May God bless you and, and keep you, make his face shine upon you and give you his peace in these uncertain times. Hopefully I will see you very soon. And Margaret really wanted me to pass on her thanks to us all uh, for our partnership and support. Uh, as well. So why don't we pray as she's asked us to. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Margaret and for the wonderful work that she does uh, crossing cultures there. Uh, we do pray that you'd be at work enabling her to have those conversations so that the women would be able and willing to chat, whether it be over the phone or those Zoom meetings. Uh, Lord, we do pray that you would make sure that certain women aren't disconnected from those ongoing relationships. Pray for wisdom around the food pantry. But we especially want to commit to you, Margaret, now and ask that you'd help her to use this time uh, to not only be fruitful, but also restful. Uh, as we know, she's quite busy. And so we commit her to you and pray, Lord, that you would bless and keep her too. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm just jealous thinking of Margaret sitting there with a whole plate of baklava all by herself. Uh, well, finally, part of our church news is Connect Cards. Uh, they're still available out in the welcome uh, bench in the foyer there. If you've got questions, comments, or prayer requests, please fill them out and uh, we'll respond to them. Uh, that would be fantastic. Well, that's it for church news. Uh, we're going to have a time of prayer now for our community. And the person that I was rostered isn't here. Is there somebody else who's been swapped? No, that's cool because I have prayers. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, direct our hearts to the love of our Heavenly Father and to your steadfastness. So we will submit to your will uh, to serve Jesus with joy and endure through you, our great Saviour. Amen. We praise and thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word to us through the book of Nehemiah and by your spirit enable us to continue to be kingdom builders in our lives and as a church, building our relationships with you, our church community and Christ-likeness. We pray for the families and teachers these holidays 
to have rest and refreshment and to be safe if they're traveling around. We praise you, Father, for the safe arrival of Finn and Chapman and pray for Kieran, Anna and Andy as they welcome him into their family, that Anna will get the rest that she needs and that she will be sustained by your mighty love. We give you thanks for our children's and youth ministry leaders who have served faithfully this term. May they return refreshed and full of your love to continue serving you next term. Father, we pray for our growth groups, giving thanks for the leaders of each group and, and for those who host, praying that all who share in the groups will continue to grow together to be more like Jesus. We pray that members will be encouraged and equipped to spend time with God in his word and in prayer. We give you thanks for the Mac Vision meetings last week, that so many of our church members could come together to consider the, the new God-shaped and God-sized vision and mission for our church. We pray that you would continue to give us clarity and conviction through the sermon series next term and our own personal reflections. And we praise you, loving God, rich in mercy, for making us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in sin. We pray for those impacted by the recent spread of COVID, for the sick to recover and for frontline health workers to be safe. We also pray for our Christian brothers and sisters who, can't, who either can't meet or will do so with significant restrictions to continue to trust in you, who cannot be stopped or limited. Strengthen all your people for their witness and work in the world and empower your ministers faithfully to proclaim the gospel that those who confess your name may live together in unity and love and proclaim your glory in all the world. <clears throat> Give wisdom to the leaders in authority in every land and guide all peoples in the way of righteousness and peace so that all may share with justice the resources of the earth, work together in trust and seek the common good. We pray for our federal, state and local government bodies as they deal with the COVID pandemic. We ask that honesty and divine guidance be sought in ruling and decision-making. We pray for our community here in Mittagong and for those living in outlying towns, for people in aged care facilities and for children and young people, that confusion and uncertainty be banished, that we do not take for granted the treasure we have in Christ, but live lives so surrendered to our God that the world will be confronted by the transforming power of your love in us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come now to a time of confession, which is a, a really helpful thing for us to do before we, in a sense, uh, have a, a sense of meeting God in his word. Uh, confession enables us to come without any barrier, without any sense of burden of guilt. And so... Let us hear this call to confession from God himself, from Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. God is calling us to this blessing through confession. Because although we are the people of God, the scripture reminds us that we still sin. So we need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus died for us, and intercedes for us with the Father. Let us draw near to God who freely forgives through his infinite goodness and mercy and pray to him with sincerity and confidence. Before we join in saying this confession out loud together, I'm going to give us some time to read over it, to consider the words um, as we, before we say them to our God. So let's just have a time of reflection. Let's confess our sins to God. 
Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. Let's hear these words of assurance of our forgiveness from Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Well, as we come now to the time of hearing God's word, uh, let's pray together um, as we seek that. Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word, that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite the readers to come on up. There's a slight change in the New Testament reading. It just won't be as long. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Here ends the reading. And this is uh, the second reading, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the law are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Okay, so I just need to clarify uh, the readings. <laughs> Things got a little bit uh, confusing. <coughs> Passage for today that I'm going to be preaching is just from Luke chapter 5, beginning of verse 12, and going all the way through to 26. 
All right. Okay. Uh, because we're picking up Luke, um, finishing Nehemiah. We're picking up Luke for a couple of weeks. Uh, and this part of Luke is about investigating the man who is the son of God. Uh, so it's a great part of Luke's account. And I'm going to lead us in prayer now as we get into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to come to you, the Father. And so I ask that each one of us this morning would meet Jesus as he is this morning through his word and that you would uh, either begin or grow our faith in him, in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who know kids, have been around kids, might have kids, whatever, uh, you'll know that when they are really young and they have a hurt, uh, maybe they get a scratch, even if it's the tiniest scratch. Maybe there's not even any blood whatsoever. What is the answer? What's the way to fix it and cure it? A kiss? A band-aid. That's right. Either one is the magical cure. But then we grow up, don't we? And we become more and more aware of the fact that we live in a world uh, full of people desperately in need of healing. Not just from physical things, but often emotional, mental and spiritual need of healing. We only have to look at the moment at the news. It's full of selfishness. Our, our toilet papers disappeared from the racks again. But it's still full of violence. In the midst of a pandemic, there is still violence and there's so much loss that just goes on and on. And of course, there is COVID. Uh, a stark reminder that we live in a broken world, a world in need of healing. But it's not just at the moment. Human history is full of healing attempts by our world, by people, by governments, by nations, whether that be the physical, whether that be the medical. I mean, there is just a constant desire, isn't there, uh, to, to come up with the new drug, the new way to live longer and all those. But it's also that awareness that, yes, there are, deeper needs and our societies are trying to to come up with the the way that will heal those but in the end we just live in a society where so many people are numbed by tv to the pain or they're purchasing whatever it is uh just the act of buying stuff that retail therapy to ease the pain that's why the, the question that we're asking today is so relevant, but not just for out there in the world, but for us. Who will heal you? Wherever you're at today, whatever healing you or I need, let alone our world, who will heal us? Well, the answer is Jesus. Because as we're seeing in these two uh, great accounts of Jesus, that Jesus is willing and able to heal the deepest wounds. Jesus is willing and able to heal the deepest wounds that we have. We're going to look at these two, what for many of us will be familiar stories, but they are so incredible. And I hope that uh, we're just not, we don't kind of just go, oh, yeah, we know those. I don't know about you, but I never get tired of seeing a sunrise or a sunset that's, that's really beautiful. The thing is, they're the same. Well, I hope today as we look at this story that we probably, it's still the same as the last time we read it. I still, I hope it would be just as magnificent and wonderful to us. Because the first thing we see in the first part of the account is that Jesus is willing. Jesus is willing and he is really put to the test here, not because it's difficult to heal in a sense, but because this man is covered in leprosy, the skin disease that makes people, particularly back then, just disgusting. It just ravages the whole outer person because there was no treatment back then. A person was just isolated, cast out. Isn't it so interesting and powerful that as we're told, as we come to chapter 12, verse 12 rather, as they're coming along, this man 
he saw Jesus in verse 2. He fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Do you see how he doesn't doubt that Jesus can? What he doubts is, is Jesus willing? For someone like him. And so he's he's so desperate, he is begging Jesus. Will you? You can, but are you willing to heal me? A couple of years ago, uh, we watched a, a TV series by the BBC. Uh, it was about called, it was Robin Hood, right? Great story, loved it. Um, but there was one really powerful moment where one of the knights fighting in the Crusades came home, he came home with leprosy. And when the town that he was living in discovered this, uh, there was this huge outrage. And in the end, they gathered in the the cemetery of the town, the whole town, even his family, and a grave was dug for him and he was made to stand in the grave and a funeral was held for him. While he was there, as if he was dead. He was dead to the family, to the community, and he was sent out. And similar circumstance for this man. He is completely cut off from society. In fact, as a leper, he was required not only to live outside, but if he had to come in for anything, as soon as he was around people, he would have to yell out, unclean, unclean, so people could avoid him. But it's not just cut off from his society. He is cut off from God because God, God is holy. And so part of the the rules that the uh, Israelites and the Jews had was that if you were unclean, you could not come into the temple, let alone, uh, well, you couldn't come into the temple. And so this is why he comes begging and so uncertain that someone like him could even come before Jesus. Jesus doesn't keep a safe distance. We all know about safe distances now, don't we? He doesn't use words. Jesus could so easily have said, oh, look, mate, that's, that's far enough. Look, I'm so powerful. I could just use my words. It's all good. No. He's willing to touch the untouchable. Look with me at verse 13. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. The shock by everybody there would have been palpable. We we now know because of COVID, we have such a greater awareness of transmission and touching, don't we? But Jesus, still touching the man, says, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. See how Jesus, when normally when you, you're clean and you touch the unclean, you become unclean. But with Jesus, no, he makes people clean. But what's so powerful here really is that Jesus is willing, willingly to come to earth as a man, the son of God, and then to cross boundaries. There is no barrier he will not cross so that he can love the unlovely. Because you see, Jesus is not just healing his body. There's something so much greater going on here. He is now reconciled with his family, with his friends, with his town, and even with God, which is why Jesus will go on to say, go to the priest, go and show, be proven that you are now clean. He's given him his life back. Because this is what Jesus came to do. For anyone. And this is why, actually, Jesus, as you'll notice in the, the passage, Jesus tells him not to tell anyone, and that happens a lot, but everybody keeps telling everybody else. Um, it's because Jesus is trying to show, I'm not just here, some magician, some healer. There is something so much more powerful going on here, and he doesn't want to be derailed by public popularity. No, there's a deeper healing at work here what we see is that there is no reason, no reason for anyone to doubt that Jesus is willing to heal them, to heal you. There is no one who is too bad for Jesus. There is no Christian who is not good enough 
for Jesus to be willing to reach out and touch you and bring healing. Reminds me of the story of a, of a daughter who's 14 uh, living in a town and she got, you know, typical 14-year-old, had a big bunny with her parents, just such a terrible life that she was living. So she runs away to the big city and finds a life in there. And so her dad will work during the week, but every weekend he goes into the city and he just walks the streets, not just at day, but at night. Because a 14-year-old girl, as the year goes on, there's only so many ways she can make a living. And he searches and he searches and he cannot find her. And after 12 months, sort of the last act of desperation, he produces this little flyer and he just puts it all over the city. And it says, Abigail, whatever you've done, whatever you've become, I love you. Please meet me at Central Station on this Saturday at this time. 22 Abigails turned up. Jesus, Jesus is willing. Jesus is coming saying, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've become, I love you and I am willing to heal you. To restore you not only back to a new life, but a life with God. To heal the deepest wounds, our spiritual brokenness. Who will heal you? It's Jesus. He's willing. But we also need to know, don't we, that Jesus is able. Because there's plenty of people who are willing to try and help someone. But if they're not able, then there's not much help there. Now, what we see is Jesus is not only willing, but he is able. And that's the scene in the next story that we have, one of my favorites. Uh, but what we see here is this is a test. This is a test moment for the, by the religious leaders the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, we're told they come from all over the place. They're really wanting to put Jesus on trial. And that's why we read in verse 17, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. It's not saying that Jesus' power for healing comes and goes. It's trying to help us to see, or get the point that there's the religious leaders, but it's Jesus who is God's agent. For healing. It's Jesus who has come with God's authority. And so we have this incredible account, don't we? These friends, what amazing friends. Uh, they bring this paralyzed man to Jesus and they're not willing to let anything get in the road, even somebody's roof. And just picture the scene in your mind. There, right in front of Jesus, the dust has fallen, there's a hole, the, the, the sun is shining through the ceiling, and there is a paralyzed man that everybody would have known. They would have walked past him in the street, and here he is, and there is Jesus. And this is exactly why so many of them have come, to see him do incredible things. That's why the friends have gone so far to bring him there. The place is packed. Just the heat coming off all these people. Yet it's still so quiet you could hear a fly fart. This is it. What is he going to do? Well, Jesus says, verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. You can easily imagine their disappointment, can't you? It's probably one of the biggest letdowns in human history. Come on, Jesus. That kind of sounds nice, but the legs, that's what this is about. That's what we came to see. That's what they dug a hole in the roof for. Do your thing. And Jesus is saying, that's exactly what I'm doing. This is Jesus' greatest priority. Many of us will be familiar with this story as it is and as it continues from this moment. But I just want us to stop for a moment and, and just pretend that the rest of it doesn't happen. Just think, imagine if Jesus stopped there. That was it. That's all he did for the guy. Friend, your sins are forgiven. What would that mean? Well, he'd go home to his same life, wouldn't he? But, but he, 
he's not the same. He is now forgiven. That means he is right with God. He's no longer alone, no matter how difficult things get. He's no longer got a burden of guilt before God. He might feel like he's a burden to others, but before God, that burden is gone. He has a certain hope of heaven. I mean, what good is it for him being able to walk if he's headed straight to hell? No, he has the hope of heaven where he will walk that first date up to Jesus with his new body that he'll have forever. And that first day he'll thank Jesus. And for a thousand days afterwards, for a thousand years and a million years, he'll still be able to thank Jesus. By saying to him, friends, friend, your sins are forgiven. That's the greatest healing that Jesus can offer him. But is he able? The religious leaders, they're right to a certain extent. Only God can forgive sins against God. That's exactly why Jesus says, I forgive you. But he knows, he knows that they're testing him. But I actually think, as Jesus often does, he's flipping it around. Jesus is testing them. And so he asks them the question in verse 23, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? It's a great question. Jesus is so good at this stuff. See, no one can prove in a sense that you've forgiven someone's sins. But a paralyzed man, making him walk, well, that's surely that's the, the harder thing. But in the end, nobody can do either. Only God has the power to do that. And so verse 24, we read Jesus saying, but that you may know that the Son of, God, Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat. And go home. And immediately, immediately he did. He goes back home. He goes back to his brand new life. And all because Jesus has the power with just words. Jesus is able to heal and do the impossible. Because he has authority. He has God's authority. That's what he's proving here. Just like a paralyzed man can't heal himself, neither can we heal ourselves from the life-threatening illness of sin, that heart disease. But Jesus, Jesus is the one who is able to say to you, friend, your sins, they are forgiven when we trust in him. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus, isn't it? And it sounds simple, but it was so costly. Jesus on the cross, he's saying, for your freedom, I will face judgment. So you can go into glory with God. I have gone to Golgotha. But that's how he is able to forgive our sins, to forgive you and I for any and all of the sins in our life. Because he is not only willing, but he is also able to heal our deepest wounds. See, sin is the most damaging thing in our life. Do we believe it? Because it's really easy, isn't it, to get caught up, particularly at the moment, thinking, no, 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 the biggest issue I've got is COVID. Or that maybe there are other practical things going on in our life and we're just going, God, why don't you just fix those? Jesus is actually saying, I've come to heal your deepest wounds. Or if he has, let's remember, that's what's taken place. I, recently in one of my Christianity Explored groups, somebody asked this question because we work our way through Mark's account of Jesus' life. 
and they see the healings that he's doing. And the question was, well, why doesn't Jesus heal everyone? Not just these few random people that he comes with, like, why not everyone? It's a really good question because he's clearly willing, as we've seen today, and he is able. Why not just relieve the suffering of people? Well, Jesus is showing us that the reason he came the reason he is willing and he is able is to heal anyone from sin. That is our greatest problem. Because when he heals us from sin, we are made alive with Christ. That's why Jesus, in chapter 4, just before this, he's been healing people and he's gone off for some time to pray and the disciples have come looking for him going, Jesus, well, come on, we've got to get back into town. Uh, people are looking for you. It's going so well. And this is what Jesus says in verse 43. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. That's the greatest healing anyone needs, to be brought into the kingdom of God, this new life reconciled with God, not just for today, not just for a thousand days, not for a thousand years, but for millions and millions and millions of years. It's because that new life reconciled with God actually then shapes even all our relationships for the better today. Doesn't it? When we're healed like this, it will shape all our relationships. In fact, I hope we're encouraged to be like those four friends. If we have known the healing that Jesus gives, that we will not let anything get in the way of bringing those people, that our family, our friends, to bring them to Jesus so that they too can be made alive with him. That's why we want to be sharing Christ who is willing and able to heal their deepest wounds. It's why, sadly, we were going to be hearing from Margaret today. I see she, and we partner with her, seeks to bring the healing that Jesus and only Jesus can offer. It's a wonderful thing to be able to partner with her in that work. Because Jesus, he too came to cross cultures, to cross the boundaries. He loves the people that she is ministering to, so we too should love them as well. Jesus is willing and able to heal our deepest wounds. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you so much thanks for Jesus, who's shown that he, he is willing to touch us, the untouchable, the unworthy, and to love us no matter what we've done, no matter what we've become. He loves us and he's willing to heal us. But he is also able through his death on the cross to remove our sins. He is able to heal our greatest uh, wound, our heart disease of sin. And so we come before you and we, we thank you Jesus, for healing us. And I pray that those of us you've healed would be so keen, so willing to do whatever it took, not letting any barrier come between us and bringing others to meet Jesus. And we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're going to respond to God's word now um, with a great song, Not I, But Christ in Me. Uh, and again, it's a wonderful time for us just to sit and reflect on what God has said to us and how we might respond with the words of this song in a prayer. So let's listen and sing in our souls. It's been wonderful to join together as we've been able to this morning. And to be reminded of the question, well, who can heal you? Well, it's Jesus. 
Let's join in saying this prayer of thanks together. Uh, we'll say it out loud. Let's pray. Father, take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, in a moment, we can head on out and are we doing morning tea? We are? Great. All right. Well, just hang on there, guys. Um, we're going to, Chris, can we wave to everybody? Can we have it so that the camera is working? All right. Let's give everybody a wave out there in online line world. Give them a wave. All right. Oh. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, let's go and enjoy morning tea. We'll, we'll need to sit down. Uh, for morning tea so we can't be moving around and keep our distances but uh, god bless and uh, let's continue to be talking with one another about how jesus can heal us